Let's bow our head in prayer. Holy God, may the meditations of our hearts, may the words of my lips be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. So folks, um, we've been going through this sermon series in this season of Lent, New Life. And it, we used for inspiration that passage from John 10.10, 10, where Jesus said the thief comes to kill and destroy, but he, Jesus, comes to bring life, life to the full. And it's a great journey that we're on going through this time of Lent. We thought in the first week about how God brings new life in the wilderness, last week in surrender, remember, new relationship, new name, surrender in faith, and surrender to God's will brings new life. In between last week's reading and this week's reading, something important happens in the people of God's story, which we don't hear about this week because we're up to Moses, but in between, another relationship, another new name. Jacob wrestled with the Lord our God and was no longer known as Jacob, which means, may God protect but known as Israel. First time we hear the word, the name Israel. Jacob is no longer Jacob, but the people of God become known as Israel. Another step along the way. New relationship, new name. And here, this week, we have Moses. We're not going to look into great detail on Moses, but we will pick up these words. It's a sentence of the day, sentence for this, this Sunday, this week. And God spoke all these words and said, I am the Lord your God. How about you say that with me? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Key words in the history of the people of God. I am the Lord your God. Hear that? Relationship. God has picked this people. I am the Lord, your God. You are my people. I have brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. New life in the wilderness, new life in surrender. And this week we look at new life in wisdom. New life in wisdom. Well, it's pretty cool that in the Bible we have a book the book of wisdom, <laughs> isn't that great? The book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs. And in my little Bible, NLT translation, it says of wisdom this, knowledge is good, but wisdom is even better. Knowledge can help you pass tests and accomplish tasks, but wisdom will guide you through the most important decisions in life. Well, in Proverbs 1, verse 7, we hear this. The fear or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and destruction. Knowledge, wisdom. That's what we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to look at it looking first of all at the Gospel and then we'll come to the New Testament letter. So, John's Gospel, chapter 2. Then Jesus' disciples remembered this prophecy from the scripture. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. What? they exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he'd said this. And they believed. They believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. 
They believed in the scriptures and what Jesus had said. New life in wisdom, new life in Jesus. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, the wisdom of God is the person of Jesus. The wisdom of God is the person of Jesus. So he says, God united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him, Jesus, to be wisdom itself. He embodies it. He is not just the way, the truth and life. He is the way, the truth and life. He is God's wisdom. He goes on to say, Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. Jesus is God's wisdom. We heard about Peter last week. You know, we know Peter. One moment he's on fire for Jesus. Yes, I believe. And the next moment, oh, I don't know about this, you know, walking on water, then sinking. But after the resurrection, he with the other disciples said, well, now we understand what he said. Now we understand what the scriptures said about him. Now we understand not just knowledge, but this wisdom of God has been revealed to us. Paul, a great uh, Jewish scholar, persecutor of the Christian church, encounters Christ on the road to Damascus. The risen Lord appears to him. He had great knowledge, but God reveals his wisdom, the wisdom of Christ to him and he puts his faith in Jesus and he becomes a voice for Jesus and we read from one of his letters to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 19 and he says this, remembering that he was not a believer and then became a believer. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, he's quoting Isaiah here, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. Wow. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. Philosophers, scholars, brilliant debaters, and in today's world, influencers. If you don't know what it is, ask a young person later. All these people with great knowledge, great knowledge. Well, Aristotle was known for great knowledge, and that's what he said. Knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Bump, bum. What does God say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I tried to find myself and I couldn't find myself, but when I was found in Christ, I found out who I was. The wisdom of God is the person of Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that we don't have to be all, you know, non-intellectual and non-academic and not have our, a brain, you know, leave, park your brain outside and no, no, Knowledge is one thing, God's wisdom is another. Plenty of great and intellectual people have had the wisdom of Christ revealed to them. There have been people who had great intellect, but there have also been believers in Jesus. Knowledge, wisdom. So it's not about relying on and depending upon our own knowledge, but believing in the wisdom of of God, that is, in Christ Jesus. Just to illustrate this, this last week, some of you might do our daily bread. I'm an our daily bread person. And um, if you've read this, you can give some pointers later. But someone wrote about how they knew of someone who came to faith by reading one of the most boring books in the Bible, Leviticus. Someone this morning at 8 o'clock said, I came to faith through Leviticus as well. Listen to this person's story. The topic was Leviticus. And I had a confession to make. I skipped a lot of the reading. 
I told my Bible study group, I'm not reading about skin diseases again. That's when my friend Dave spoke up. I know a guy who believed in Jesus because of that passage. Even Leviticus. He said, he explained that his friend was a doctor who had been an atheist. He decided that before he completely rejected the Bible, he better read it for himself. The section on skin diseases in Leviticus fascinated him. Glad it fascinated someone. <laughs> it, can, it contained surprising details about contagious and non-contagious sores and how to treat them. He knew that this far surpassed the medical knowledge of his day. Yet there it was in the Levit Leviticus. There's no way Moses could have known all this, he thought. The doctor began to consider that Moses really did receive his information from God. And eventually, he put his faith in Jesus. Knowledge and God's wisdom. Knowledge and God's wisdom. Paul continues to write in his letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 1, Verse 21. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he used our foolish preaching to, so, to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. Signs from heaven seeking human wisdom. Greeks, Jews, people of our day. I know when um, I'd become a new Christian, I had a, a mate who was in um, the local Apex club that I was involved with at the day and he heard I was going off to college and he said, why do you believe in all that stuff? You know the disciples were a bunch of misfits and no hopers and very, you know, fishermen. They had no brains amongst them. But what about Luke, the physician, the doctor? What about... Paul, who was a, a great academic and a Jew. But there's people of our day who also say, what are you on about? How can you believe in that rot? It's true for the day back then, it's true for the day today. So he continues to say, so when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles, Gentiles say it's all nonsense. Your Saviour died on the cross. But to those who are called by God to salvation, listen, both Jews and Gentiles, so there's some Jews and Gentiles that did come to believe, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In one of his other letters, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus saying, in chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. God gives the gift of faith that we might know the wisdom of God in what Christ has done. They asked for a sign. The sign was standing in front of them. They looked for, for wisdom or God's wisdom, not human wisdom, God's wisdom, divine wisdom was there staring them in the face. Jesus I was blind, but now I see. Some years ago, I was um, ministering in a particular place and there was a, a guy who, you know, we were mates. He um, was, used to teach Sunday school where he came from and he said, you know, I teach Sunday school, but my wife, she's the real believer in the family. I don't really understand it all. I don't know how she understands this thing of faith. I'm still searching. I'm still trying to work it all out, I don't really believe it, you know. I thought, oh wow, radio. And anyway, we had an alpha course running and he kept having this wrestle and say, I just don't know how you believe, I just don't get it. And then um, he'd hear the sermons in church that were, you know, supporting all that he was learning through alpha. And he took that step of, I don't understand it 
and he said, took the step of faith. He said, I don't know how I didn't get it. I don't know how people don't believe. <laughs> it just it was so amazing. One moment, step of faith, one place to the other. God's grace, God's wisdom, God's self-revelation. Paul continues to write, this foolish plan of God <laughs> is wiser than the wisest of human plans and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. God's wisdom on the cross. God's wisdom in Christ crucified. God's wisdom in Christ who was raised to new life. Foolishness to the world, but for those who believe, it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. New life in the wilderness, new life in surrender, new life in the wisdom, the wisdom of God in Christ Jesus. So let us pray. Lord, as we gather to hear and think upon your word this morning, we pray for the gift of faith. Help us to see the things of your kingdom. Help us to understand the, the mystery of your kingdom. Humanly speaking, what you have done and what you continue to do, Lord, is out of this world and doesn't make sense, humanly speaking. But, Lord, through the eyes of faith, uh, we can see how wonderful and powerful a gift it is that you've given your son Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of the world, that we might be forgiven and receive new life in him. So Lord, open the eyes of our heart, the eyes of our mind and our spirit to the truth of Christ. Help us to see that he died for all that is evil, all that is bad. Help us to trust in him, to know that he is the way, the truth and the life, that he is the wisdom, your wisdom. And Lord, as you forgive us our sins, you give us that new life by your word and by your spirit. So come, fill our hearts, Lord, with your love we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.